Um, why don't we start? Um, Nicole, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us to the audience who you are and what you do and anything that you want to share with us about. And everybody, mic, mic, uh, mute your mics. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I bring you greetings from 108 degrees in Arizona today. Uh, I am a child of Salem. I have been a member since it started. Um, so it's very, really great to see everybody. A lot of people on here already kind of know who I am, but for those of you all who don't, I am uh, a counselor and I am currently counseling faculty and counselor at Mesa Community College. Uh, I sit on a couple of boards and a, a leadership team. I am um, married for 18 years, three kids. Um, what else? Anything else interesting? That's it. Um, just happy that we've reopened a little bit. Arizona is a little bit of a different beast. We have the people who put on masks and don't put on masks. I'm still wearing my mask, uh, but we're pretty much fully open now. So it's really good to see you guys. Awesome. Thank you and welcome. We're so glad to have you and all of your expertise. Um, Dr. Leslie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Leslie Ann Brown Henderson, and I work at Northwestern. I've worked at Northwestern University for the past eight years. Um, I am acting chief of staff there for our vice president of student affairs, and I work in campus inclusion and community. I have my doctorate in counseling psychology, um, so I've done some work with students and community members around mental health and wellness. Um, I am not a child of Salem. I am married to a child of Salem. Um, my husband is Brian Henderson and also was born into Salem um, Baptist Church. And um, so I think I'm a, I'm a family member of Salem. And um, I have two children as well. My son is three and my daughter is a year and they should be running through the door here not not too long. So they might join the camera at some point. Um, but I think we're all navigating life and family and spouses and um, all the things amidst COVID. And I think that's also my reality. So I'm really excited to be here with you all and look forward to our conversation. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Leslie. Uh, Pastor Kerry? Uh, yes, I'm Harvey Kerry, and I am a son of Salem, but I am a brother of uh, the Henderson crew. Um, it was uh, Miss Mama Henderson who played a huge role in my spiritual development. I often tell Yvette that it was me coming from Northwestern, watching her worship and love God that actually was one of the reasons that I actually joined Salem. I never will forget watching her. And Nicole and her husband, I mean, if you don't know this, but when our church just began, they uh, lived and served with us for a long time, bringing uh, their gifts to Citadel of Faith. So we would not be who we are as a church without uh, Nicole and her family. And so I'm just, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm really excited about this conversation because I really feel as though uh, Christians do not talk about mental health. Uh, we uh, don't uh, address the issues that affect us so acutely. And so to have this forum and to have this opportunity is such an uh, honor. So I'm just glad to be here to serve. I am in Detroit, Michigan. I'm the senior pastor of Citadel of Faith Covenant Church. Uh, and I, um, I, hate, I hate summer. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I'm experiencing another set of trauma because uh, I sweat like, a, like just crazy. So pray for me, please. <laughs> that's good that's good well would you lead us in a word of prayer of our sweating pastor please yes i sure will god we do love you and we thank you for those who have gathered uh virtually here uh to discuss and to lean into this subject of dealing with trauma in the midst of this pandemic and we pray holy spirit that you would be with us uh there are people on this um call zoom call who are personally affected by trauma. Uh, others of them, God, are uh, standing in proxy for those whom 
uh, they know uh, are being affected. So all of us have a responsibility to, uh, to learn um, not just how to cope, but how to overcome and how to thrive in the midst of these great challenges. So be with us is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. 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 So I'm excited that all of you who have decided to join us today are here. Uh, we're grateful for that. We know that you could be any other place, and so we're grateful. What we want to do is we want to start with one of the first questions that have been coming across. Um, people are becoming more acquainted uh, with mental and emotional strain. What should individuals do when we become anxious about sheltering in or even in this case about uh, venturing back out. And any of our guest panel can talk with that about it. I didn't hear the last part of that question if that it, it may have frozen. Okay. Um, so if you would just repeat that. Sure, so what should individuals do when becoming anxious about the end of sheltering in? Yeah. Anyone want to start with that? Uh, I'll go ahead and start it. Um, end is here for me right now, so I'm going to give a lot of personal perspective first. Um, like I said, the a clinical one, it's, it's based off of norms and nothing about this is normal. So good luck with that one. Um, but uh, the fear of going out after being closed in is no different um, than the fear of when I had my first child. Um, the whole entire world seemed poisonous until my kids got his vaccination. So I just viewed the world from the scope of being a dangerous place. At a certain point, he got these shots, and then from what I was told, things would get better. He'd be safe for the world. Lo and behold, he just became a cesspool, a petri dish of all types of germs that just infected me. It didn't change my love for him. It didn't change how I treated him. But the exposure, the awareness of it is what kind of cripples us. So uh, like I've shared with a lot of the students I've had to counsel is that our awareness is everything. You know, the moment we become aware that we can die, it changes how we move. And so here it is, we know that we have more exposure to something. So the fear is natural. It's your response to the fear, right? It's the response to the anxiety. So you can do as much as possible to take care of yourself. Make sure you make sure you take care of your mask. Be very firm and assertive about personal distancing when you don't feel like someone's honoring that. Um, but the anxiety is a normal expression of fear. You know, it's, it's, it's what if this happens to me? And it brings us very much so into the space of hyper-realism about our mortality um, at any moment in time. So um, the anxiety is normal and there's really no real solution other than taking care of yourself knowing the things that trigger you if crowded places trigger you then you probably were triggered by that before you just really never paid attention so just see what it says about you when you're feeling anxious and make the necessary steps to avoid that as much as possible yeah and let me just chime in from a um pastoral uh standpoint I, I do believe that you know and there's this huge tension right now between people of faith and science as if they are in conflict and i don't believe that they're in conflict at all i think that intelligent people need to always follow the facts uh, but yet we still know that jesus christ who is the one that we believe lives in us uh encountered many facts that were not uh the end all uh, so even though we know that there are statistics and even though we know that there are things that we must do and should do, I think that when people let fear completely grip them, uh, it causes them to not live a full life. And so I, I, I'm just encouraging people uh, who are struggling with the idea of, okay, what does reopening mean and how do we do it? Follow the guidelines, as was stated already, uh, that are out there. 
but do not live in this uh, this cocoon fear that keeps you from relationships, keeps you from uh, enjoying uh, the, the parts of life that we can enjoy. So I just think we need to do it intelligently, but we are people of faith. And in that, we let me tell you something. As a black man in America, every time I leave the house, I'm scared. Uh, anxiety hits me as a black man driving, as a black man jogging, as a black man walking, as a black man being anything. And so if I, if I allowed that fear to grip me, I would never leave my house. Uh, so I, I, I take precautions, but I leave with prayer. And I think the same thing is true with the pandemic. Uh, we need to take the necessary precautions, but not allow the reality of the challenge to keep us uh, fearful to the point of, uh, of not being alive. Yeah, and if I can share a very quick story. So when this all started happening, my dad, my family's from Jamaica. I don't know if most of you know that, but I'm very proud of my heritage. And my dad called me with his very serious voice and um, Jamaican accent and said, go and buy some oil. And I was like, go buy some oil. Like, why am I buying oil, dad? And he's like, go buy some oil, anoint the oil and put it on your doorpost. And I was like, Okay, so in my, in my natural body, I was like, why am I going to do this? But my father said I should do it, right? And I know biblically it's something that was done, right? Putting oil on your, on your doorposts to cover your household and cover your children. So I followed the instruction of my father, even though I may have felt like, is it really going to do anything or why am I doing this? And my babies are looking at me as I'm putting oil on their face and praying over them. But that was the instruction that my father gave me. And guess what? Every single time I leave the door, I feel a little bit more at peace. Nothing has changed in my circumstance. But it was something about my father who I trust, following the instructions that he gave me, that gave me an, a peace, right? And I think it's very, tr it's similar to the instructions that are being given to us about how we navigate COVID, right? It's, we trust our government, that's what, we trust our God first. We trust our, our government to be guiding us in the areas that we don't have expertise, but they do, which is the science piece of what Reverend Kerry was saying. And then they've given us clear instructions. So let's follow those instructions in between our faith, our understanding and trusting the people that are in leadership, and then our following the instruction that should help alleviate some of our anxiety and some of our angst. Um, and that's what it's done for me. So that's what I've been trying to follow. Not only what my earthly father has told me to do, but also what my heavenly father has told me to do. Auntie Yvette, you're muted. I muted so that um, we wouldn't get the feedback from you. So I apologize for that. But I'm so grateful for you all's input in that because this is a real thing as each state is opening up in different phases. And we just heard from our governor not too long ago yeah. about us going into phase three. So uh, we realize that some people are anxious about that. So I'm grateful uh, for that. I want to move to the next question and I have for you guys. Uh, families have been sheltering in for all this period of time. They've been able to connect with one another and show affection to one another. But there are men and women uh, who um, are becoming anxious, who live alone, uh, who've not received any physical touch for almost three months. And how would you suggest for those people to cope in this time? Anybody? <laughs> well, like, let, me, let, me, let me just jump in here as well. I think that uh, people who have been alone and are trying to figure out, again, this whole idea of re-entering, just like what we said before, we talked about it from a health perspective. Uh, I think that we need to talk about it from a relational perspective. And I think that uh, you can't just go from complete isolation to, in my opinion, to overstimulation at this high, crazy level. I think there may need to be some measured, measured ways in which people reconnect. And so for those who've been isolated, who've been in their homes by themselves, I think that finding a relative 
uh, that maybe they can physically connect with, maybe a, a close friend, uh, and begin those slow steps to doing that uh, will be better than becoming overwhelmed with large groups of people or those kinds of things. Because again, um, it's been a, it's been a completely different norm for months, and so the brain has become accustomed uh, to certain things, and so literally going into uh, a huge uh, kind of uh, can it can be tra can be a bit traumatic even as far as church I'm even encouraging many of my members as many 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 days down the line uh, we we open <coughs> that they consider uh, those who okay uh, we might want to mute uh, <laughs> mute your phones um, but those who are coming back to church even, uh, and again, there'll be modified numbers of people that are there, there'll be social distancing, but even that environment for some people, it will just be a bit overkill. So I just think that there needs to be some measured ways in which people reconnect even with other people that they are close to. Uh, and again, that's not a clinical, I'm sure the, the smart clinicians will have a much more uh, formal answer to that kind of uh, approach. But I think that just as any other thing, having been isolated for months, and then re-entering, it needs to be gradual and it needs to be measured. And it needs to be with people that people feel extremely comfortable with. And to not become vulnerable because now they're so hungry, in a sense, for interaction that they're letting their guards down. And I think there'll be a lot of people that will start preying on people, especially single women uh, and single men, too, who uh, are looking for affection and looking for attention. It's like, hey, girl, I know you've been locked down for three months, so uh, holla at a brother. And they might need to really uh, be careful of that kind of um, people, people that are predators that will actually start preying on people who they know are very vulnerable emotionally at this time. Um, Nicole, last time you mentioned something about um, families whose spouses are serving and how they might have some recommendations or thoughts around that. The one thing that I would add to what Reverend Carey said is many of us might be um, know about the five love languages, that book, very popular book, and it talks about different love languages. Um, so my husband's love language is physical touch. I don't, I don't need to, I'm pretty introverted and I don't need to be around people. Nicole's shaking her head because she's very similar to that. So I would be okay. Like I am not craving going out and having to hug anybody right now. Um, I don't mind doing it, but I don't need to do it. And I think one of the things that I'm learning from my husband is that for some people, they, they really crave that kind of interaction and that, um, that, um, engagement with other people. So if you are that kind of person, I think re what Reverend Carey is saying is prudent, right? Is to say, if I'm by myself, let me find one other person that I could be in connection and community with, rather than saying like, here's a whole family, or I'm gonna go hang out at somebody's house, right? We are to exercise wisdom in all things. So how do we gradually ramp up to whatever our new normal is going to be for us in our community? And that's likely starting with who is one person or a couple or you know whatever it is that I can have regular contact with that I feel like they're taking the same precautions as I'm taking. Because that's what this whole thing is about too, right? Um, and how can I kind of feed my need for being in community with people? Um, if, if you have to hug people, you know, what does that look like? Is a fist pump okay? Is it just being able to be eye to eye and look people in the eye that matters? And um, making those accommodations for yourself, but doing so in a way that's, um, that exercises wisdom. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, Leslie, you, you really hit it on the head. Here in Detroit, and many of you know this because so many kids have been denied, or not denied, but they just couldn't have proms and graduations. So as things got lifted here in uh, Detroit a bit, uh, this past weekend, there were like hundreds of, of young people and teenagers who I believe at that age, by nature, are just really, you know, very touchy-feely kind of kids. You know, they just enjoy community in that way. And although I think it was a right thing developmentally, probably to say, I need to connect with my friends and say my goodbyes and the way in which they did it 
was dangerous. It was just inappropriate and it was, it, it, it could create harm to them or to their loved ones. So I just think that we have to know that there are people who really do crave that, uh, even developmentally. Uh, so, I mean, we may be talking about uh, what adults who have been sheltered in place feel like, but what about kids? I mean, we, I mean, kids are used to hugging everybody and, and grandma and grandpa and auntie and uncle and cousins. And so we've got to continue to teach them a new normal as it relates to re-engaging with touch, which is huge for a child. And so I just think that we need to really lean into this conversation. Uh, and again, like Leslie said, I mean, finding that one person or two people that are maybe family members that have been uh, observing those practices and are safe uh, and allowing maybe that child who craves, I got to hug some, you know, granny or Nana or somebody, uh, allowing them to do that if all those things have been put in place. But I think to say to them, oh, no, kids, we're not going to be hugging anymore. I mean, that would just cause developmentally kids to be in, in, in a space that might not be good for them as they go forward. So it's a conversation that's greater than just the adult, but definitely our kids and our uh, uh, children and our adolescents. Thank you for adding that component to it, because I think that that's an important component uh, for us to consider. I wanted to uh, switch just a little bit. Uh, when we, when, uh, what do we as Christians think about God in this moment? when this pandemic hits us. And um, some may begin to question their faith because loved ones have been lost, loved ones have been sick, uh, just even the very nature of who God is, and then others may be fortified. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and the struggle that we have right now in, uh, in our faith? Um. I find this always um, an interesting perspective. I've realized that I like to intellectualize things. So I've had to grow a whole lot in the faith area as an individual. Um, but if anything, what I've learned that, you know, if it's, if I could see it, it's not faith. If I could see how this works out, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't faith. And so we're so used to normalcy, right? So there's so many non-faith based acts that we do on a daily basis. We go into our cars and for the most part, we assume it's going to start. We sit our behinds on a chair and we assume that it's going to hold us because it held us yesterday. Uh, we go to a job knowing that we have a job because we had a job yesterday. Um, so we do a lot of non-faith based things. Um, but God didn't change who he was when the tsunami hit Japan and wiped out lots of people. It did not change who God was when apartheid was sweeping through South Africa. It didn't change who God was when uh, SARS was taking over our, um, our Asian countries. It didn't change who God was when shootings were happening all over the country. It didn't change it. What made it different is now it's affected me. And so it's the meanness. It's the, well, God, you can't be who you are if this is bothering me. And then we go through the checklist of all the things we're doing right. And if anything, what it should do is reveal the lack of faith that you have in the first place. And it's a hard conversation to have with yourself to say, I've done a lot of non-faith-based acts. Now I have to act in a space of faith. God has not changed who he is. My awareness has changed. That's it. Um, so if anything, it should be a revelation about the faith that you need to step up, uh, even for myself and my family, being out here by myself, I've had to do a faith walk because I did not know how things were going to come out. Uh, and even with Reverend Carey in Detroit, I was like, how is this going to work? Um, and, but it takes you being outside of that comfort zone where your norms exist. You remove the norms, you see the fragility of who you are as a person. And you see that what most people in our world deal with, they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. They don't have the convenience of a door and windows uh, to separate them. They are in tight quarters because there are no other options. They're not going to sanitize bathrooms or a hand sanitizer. They barely have toiletries to take care of they, their basic hygiene needs. Our awareness has changed. It's hit us. But if anything, it should drive us to compassion to know that God is still God, no matter what the experience. No, this is not normal, but we have to keep our faith in who he is and who he's always been. So good, oh my gosh. 
uh, preached. I said, I mean, I, 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 I totally uh, concur. Um, one of the other huge pieces is that a flawed theology about who God is will make us blame him for things that have nothing to do with him. And um, sin is, is the reason that every malady that exists in the world is, is here. And that was not started because God wanted it. God initially said, I want to be your God, trust me, and it'll be beautiful. It'll be a garden. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be paradise forever. And man basically said, no, we want our own way. And the moment that we took our um, future into our own hands, literally sin entered into the world. And that means pandemics, that means tsunamis, that means injustice, that means murders. All of the things that we are currently dealing with that hurt us uh, is not because God ever wanted it. It's because we had human choice and we chose to say, God, we choose another way. So I think having that understanding, it hurts like heck. When somebody who you know is innocent dies, uh, a, a grandmother, an auntie, uh, man, senselessly gone because of some invisible disease. I mean, so we don't want to minimize or, 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 or trivialize the pain of that. Uh, somebody being shot down or, or killed, you know, mercilessly. However, we need to know the origin of it is not God. God is for us and never against us. God is, he wants our best and not, not our worst. So... Uh, we need to own that and understand that. And I think having that frame of mind, it doesn't make the, the pain go away, but it makes the blame go away. <laughs> you don't blame him for it, uh, but you still walk in the truth of the pain. Yeah. And I think one thing I just would like to kind of um, lift up that Reverend Carey said is about trivializing the pain. Um, I think as Christians, um, we use sometimes scripture, the things that we've, we, we know to be true as a way to try to tell people like, you should get over this, or you know, you know where that person went, so it's okay that they passed away, or whatever the case may be, and I think, I don't think that that's actually very helpful. <laughs> I think people will always feel the pain of loss, and there's a lot of loss that's happening right now, right? We are living in a collective trauma, and I think we're not gonna, my, um, my boss said the other day that we're not going to be able to understand the full impact until we're outside of it a little bit or away from it a little bit. But this is a collective trauma that we're all going through. So um, rather than using scripture as a way to kind of explain away or not to feel or to feel make yourself feel guilty about um, how you feel about what's going on, I suggest one of the things that I've done, a tool that if it's helpful, is I bought a new journal and you can see it right here and it has faith on the front and um, there's been so many times in my life that things have happened that I don't understand um, and I question God so like even now this might be a moment of questioning for people like why is this happening this is uncertain and sometimes it feels like well what, God why aren't you just telling me why don't you just tell me um, and one of the things in my quiet time that I've been thinking about is out of maybe the one or two times when there have been things that you haven't revealed to me, there have been multitudes of prayers that I've prayed that you've answered very clearly. And when I thought back to those moments, that helped build my faith. It was building me up in those moments. And what I've chosen to do in this particular journal is to start writing down my prayer requests, writing them down. And as things are being answered to go back and write like this is what was responded or here's the date or this happened as a way to have something written that in moments when I feel like it's so uncertain and overwhelming that I could go back and say, so I might not know this, but God has done all of these things, right? And I can remember that and stand on that even in times of uncertainty. So maybe as a tool to you all, um, creating a prayer journal or a gratitude journal or something that you can go back to, to remind yourself of who you know God to be and how he's shown up for you. Oh, that's good. I mean, yeah. just throw some uh, socks and books at all three of you. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I want to move on to our next question is, um, um, and this is very similar. The only thing I want to, do is tweak it a little bit is that there are people who have suffered loss, as you all have acknowledged, uh, several men 
with the family, as I think uh, Dr. Leslie definitely indicated. And they've died either from COVID or from other conditions, uh, but they have this guilt now of not having a formal home going service with family and friends, and they've not even been able to receive the physical comfort that normally people get when you have a home going service, picking out how many people can come, all of those kinds of elements. How do you think that we should cope or how do you suggest that we cope with that? Let me start first. Uh, I know the, the, the much smarter people will go after, uh, but you, Pastor, that along with myself have uh, had to walk with families and had to have a new normal of shepherding. And it has been, and, and all of my 30 plus years of pastoring and being in ministry, it is, this is the most difficult um, season I've ever had to face with loving families. Um, and so I, I'll just say you all, back to what Dr. Leslie said, to trivialize, to throw out little, um, you know, really, in my opinion, stupid sayings, um, it's never appropriate, even if there was not COVID. But in the midst of this reality, to just start saying stuff like, well, God knows best, and, you know, uh, heaven needed a flower, and, you know, that's, that's what there'll be another trauma, you getting hurt, because somebody will bust your brains out trying to play those kind of, uh, say those kind of things. So I think that it has been the most difficult thing to watch people die in isolation, where when I go to the hospital, I've been unable to go in the room, so I'm having to stand in the hallway and say my last, you know, words to a person through a, through a door. And then the family is out in the hallway because they can't go in the room. And then at the funeral home, there's only a few people that can be there and celebrate the life of their loved one. And then at the graveside here in Detroit, you can't even be at the physical grave as your loved one is lowered. You've got to be several feet away and just watch your loved one be like, these are, yeah, so I, from, I can't get to the clinical, cl clinical side of what it does to the mind, but the, the lack of closure, the lack of, of comfort, it's unbelievable. And I just, I just know that it is, it is our job for, as Christians to sometimes just shut up and be there, <laughs> um, you know, and not try to give answer and give reason and give stuff. Just shut up and be there. Uh, and be there in real tangible ways, like there's food on the porch. There is, um, you know, there's a bill that got paid because I just paid it, you know, uh, real tangible ways to come alongside of families. And so for those that are on the, um, the, the vid Zoom call, I'm just saying as the pastor, it would be huge if you know a need of a family, not to also say, if you need anything, call me, let me know. Their brains aren't processing what they need. You know what they need. They need food. They need, uh, you know, they need the lawn cut. They need all these other things that they can't think about. And if you just did that for them, that would be huge for them. So I, I just, as a pastor, have never faced, and again, I know that you never face this reality of walking with families. I, and then I have to cry as I'm walking away because my comfort was giving them comfort. That was, I'm a shepherd for real. So I'm like, man, God, I get to finally walk with this family and I can't walk with the family. And so it's been traumatic for me. I'll be honest with you all. I've had several people that I love that my comfort is shepherding the family that I haven't been able to receive the comfort of shepherding the family. So it's, uh, it's been a difficult time, but we can help people in tangible ways without saying pithy comments that really don't have any weight to them. I would definitely agree. And thank you for sharing that. Um, one of my best friends for one of the longest times, her dad decided to make the transition. Uh, he was on dialysis. He had a lot of heart issues and he decided that he was ready to go. Uh, so her being immunocompromised traveled home to help her dad transition home. Um, but he was in the military. He was a former state trooper and she grieved the, the loss of the ability to send him home the way she wanted to celebrate him. She said he was the last of one of the great men that walked the planet. And I've, he's broken bread in my home. I call him daddy. Um, 
and it broke my heart because I put myself in that space to say, closure means so much. We have so many different ways we have closure. So it's, it's the funeral. I mean, we, this is built into our culture. It's the funeral. It's the, the repass. It's the hugging. It's the going through. And even if it's um, cremation, there's a process that we go through. And then to remove that process suddenly, it doesn't allow the kind of closure we like. And so what has been very interesting is how many people are in this spot. And so I let her know, I said, you know, I don't know what this is like. I've never lost a parent. Um, but there are a lot of people who are like you right now who want to send people home the right way. And so I said, would it be possible to send him home this way right now and do it a little different later and also rely on the community. I sent her a couple of forums of communities of individuals who have been dealing with the trauma of not being able to eulogize their family the way that they wanted to. Um, I, I literally cannot imagine how difficult that is, especially with Reverend Carrie indicating you can't go into a hospital. Like you've got to, they won't let you in. Um, you've got to be tested. And if you're there, one of my cohort members, she, gave birth with a mask on and her husband, if he left the hospital at any time, he couldn't come back in. And she was only allowed to stay in the hospital overnight. But then you have people who go to a hospital and they wanna go in and take care of family members and they can't. I even share with my kids, I said, if you all get sick, we live in a world where I can't come and take care of you. If you go to a hospital, I can't hold you. And that's, that is, uh, that's scary, it's traumatizing. And the hard part is that there's no real solution other than this built-in solution that God has given us, which is community. He gave it to us. Um, there's a guy by the name of Dr. Henry Cloud. He's a fantastic author. Um, and he did a demonstration about a cell phone. So he said, your cell phone's sole purpose is to connect to a tower. That's it. That's all it's looking for. 100% of the time, your cell phone is looking for a connection. And so your battery goes down, not because of your Instagram or your TikTok or your Facebook or whatever you're playing on your phone. It's going down because it's always searching for a connection. And so that is literally birthed into us. We are always looking for a connection because God has put that desire in us to need each other because he knew we couldn't do this alone. He knew it from the beginning of time. So don't fight this alone. Rely on each other, pull on your network, pull on your family, rely on your community, because he gave it to us as a gift. And you may not have needed them before, but you need them now. Wow, that is good. That'll definitely preach. You'll probably hear it somewhere near. Uh... <laughs> and, and let me add one more thing to you. I know, right, uh, is that I, it's, it's, it's important to know that you can celebrate it big later. And I, I think that it's going to be amazing the amount of memorial services that are going to be held that are going to be like phenomenal. Um, and I'm always mindful of predators. I mean, you are, I've never seen more hand sanitizers in the world. And I'm like, I don't know if this is a legit at the, at the gas station. I mean, I, I could believe it. But I'm like, really? You know, because uh, <laughs> at one point there was none. Now there's like 5,000 bottles at the gas station. I don't know if this is hand sanitizer. And so they're going to, there are people that are going to profit off of people's memorial services and wanting to provide printing and blah, 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 blah. So there's nothing wrong with entrepreneurial ideas, but we need to, we need to, as a community, also help predators to not feed on the, the pain of people as they get ready to have those celebrations. But one positive is that we will get a chance and families will get a chance to have amazing celebrations. Uh, it may be modified social distancing and maybe some other things that are in place, but they, they will have a chance to come together uh, and honor that life. You know, what I've been saying to people is that I know we can't do it the way, you know, we got families that have hundreds of people, but only 10 were able to, at the funeral. <laughs> so the other people were denied it or they were watching on Zoom. And I don't know if you guys been watching the Zoom funerals. I mean, a lot of them where people are watching the casket. So to have that uh, in the future is going to be a way to bring some closure, as, as Nicole said. And I think that we just need to, to be mindful to give our seniors, especially, uh, wisdom as to not let people gouge their pocketbooks uh, with these expensive celebrations that may not entail all the things that these people are saying you've got to do 
to put their loved one away properly. Uh, I, there are people that'll be capitalizing on that in a negative way, so yeah. Uh, did you wanna share anything, Dr. Leslie, before we move on? Okay. Well, then I'm going to go to the next question. And don't get me wrong, we'll have an opportunity for you all to put in the chat uh, near the end any questions that we didn't cover that you have a question about. Um, but I wanted to ask this question. So how does, how does trauma as a person of color affected increased with COVID, with the shootings, the killings, disproportional deaths among black and brown people communities? Uh, can these layers of trauma increase levels of stress? Um, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, yes. Um, there is, so we, last time when Nicole and I shared a little bit, we talked about trauma, what trauma was, and it's kind of this emotional and um physical um, expression related to an incident that happens, right? And I think as Black folks, as folks of color, um, there is a collective trauma that exists that is embedded in the fabric of this country, right? And this is some of the work that we, I do on college campuses. And it impacts everything. When you look up, when you look at systemic racism and the physiological impacts, as well as the psychological impacts on communities of color, they're unprecedented. Um, and even when we talk about COVID as it relates to COVID, right? So a lot of what you you may have heard is like in black communities there are more black folks that are dying. And it's um, some of the reasons that are being given are things like, well, um, Black folks don't access health care or the ways um, Black folks might have more incidence of diabetes or things like that. Those are not root issues. <laughs> Those are the leaves on the tree, not the roots of the tree. Um, and when we start to dig into the roots of the tree, that's where we see um, issues of systemic racism and how they impact folks' access to medical care folks' is access to food and what food insecurity looks like. Um, when we look at policies related to redlining and how communities are so segregated, all of those things have a huge, a tremendous impact on the stress that we experience as folks of color. And then when you overlay COVID on top of that, then um, there is a rippling effect of that stress. So I'll, I'll just... I 100% agree uh, with Leslie. It, it just compiles on top of being people of color and not being believed. That plays a huge part. So you, if no one believes your experience is as bad as it is, your health concerns aren't that horrible, uh, you're not being shot that much. Um, it's enough of y'all still living, so you're good. Um, and so there's always the minimization of my pain. And so at a certain point, you just give in. It's, it's almost as if your whole spirit collapses. And you said, if, if I wasn't well, you're not going to believe me, even in mental health. You know, finding people of color, especially here in Arizona, who can service people who want to see someone of color or see someone of a particular gender. Um, it's hard because you've got to get past the narrative up here and the history up here that says, I've done this before and you didn't believe me. I had this happen before and you didn't believe me. And so when you have a system that doesn't validate your trauma, then you suffer alone. And so mm. health-wise, you internalize it, and then this becomes a struggle. And so we're dying, like Leslie said, it's underlying issues. It's, the leaves are just the expression of a whole system that doesn't validate anything that we're saying. So no, people getting shot is new. It's not been happening. Police brutality is not new. A uh, disproportionate amount of uh, uh, African Americans who suffer from heart disease, uh, hypertension, that's not new. Food deserts, food insecurity, not new. Lack of trust in medical professions is new. A great book called Medical Apartheid that actually history 
of African Americans and how the system of trust and distrust has been built into us. And so I, I don't know about you, but I think just like traits from a parent to another, that stuff gets passed on. So um, it's 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 scary to think about it as a person of color, but it's one of these things where the trauma is so more complicated for us. And we just need more people to give voice to our pain and to validate it for us. Yeah, you know, uh, it's brilliant comments um, and insights. I talked to some young African-American men and asked them, you know, uh, why are you guys not wearing masks? (laughs) You know, and they said, uh, dude, number one, uh, I'm going to die anyway. And... um, I'm not going to live long. So if I'm going to die, I'm not going to die with a mask. And I said, I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I just, I just listened, but it, it spoke to something deep to me that again, the, the trauma of, um, of many of our people who know that their future is plagued with um, not access and uh, no education to be able to having been incarcerated for something that, should have not been incarceration, you know? Uh, and now I've got a record that prohibits me. So just layer upon layer upon layer of injustice, it, it creates this, this, this trauma that becomes normal for us. So I just, I just think that we need to be very prayerful and careful entering into post-COVID America with all of the things that are starting to bud with these uh, murders and killings. And I, I can't... We, we have, we've never been in this place globally. We've never been in this place nationally. So things that have already been occurring, now it's much more acute. And any of you all that know uh, people that deal with trauma and triggers, triggers become more acute, you know, based on the conditions that are around the, the triggers, right? So coming out of a pandemic, where I haven't been able to be with my girl and I haven't been able to get my, I haven't been able to go to the club and get all this aggression out, and now you just kill somebody in front of me? <laughs> My response to that is gonna be very different than I might've been had I had some of those other normal things in place that kind of enabled me to, to at least kind of coast a bit with trauma because we are a people of trauma. Um, and so I just think we need to be very mindful of moving forward. Um, just really the acute nature of what's going on. So I think the answer is not being ignorant of this um, and those of us that are in areas of leadership talking about this publicly and, and having people own the various levels of responsibility to try to bring abatement in some areas to this. I mean, I know it's an uphill battle, but uh, for the people in power and leadership to be silent about it and to just let the pandemic be over with and just say, okay, let's just go back. No, there's not going back. There is no new normal in any facet. And we need to be mindful of that and very vigilant about that. Yeah. yeah. One other thing I just want to add is, I think as um, I can speak for me, that there's something that I internalized about not wanting to take up too much space or not wanting to be seen as someone that asks too many questions or like of causing any trouble, right? And I think some, that's something that's been internalized, whether that's in school, like you never want to be the one who speaks out too, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, and to share a really quick story, when I was having Yara, who's the baby, um, my mother-in-law was there and um, I was very adamant about my doctor. I have a black female doctor um, and she left and I had to stalk her to find her, but I did. And people were like, you're crazy. And I was like, you don't understand. This is somebody that I trust. So um, anyways, fast forward, I'm about to have this baby and it started happening very, very quickly. Like I went from nothing to like in an hour almost having her. And I remember standing up and I said, this baby is coming. And the nurse said, no, that can't be true. And I said, no, this baby is coming. And the nurse was like, no, that's that's not true. And then the doctor stepped in and said, if she says the baby is coming, the baby is coming. And sure enough, 15 minutes later, the baby was born. Um, So I share that story to say, one, get folks around you that you trust and advocate for yourself. Ask all the questions. I don't care if they are tired of hearing your questions, you keep asking them. If you don't feel well, you keep going back to the doctor. You were there yesterday, you go back the next day. 
um, we need to have voice and show up and take up the space that we need to because too often I think our folks are dying because we're not being heard we're not being listened to and we also get frustrated so we're like we're not going anymore like I went three times they sent me back home no you keep going and if you need someone to be a partner in helping you be vigilant then call up a friend call up whoever from the church and say like I need some support because you have to advocate for yourself that's really important absolutely bravo bravo I totally agree I want us to move to another area um, in which it's really important because a lot of people, some people are working at home, some people are not. Uh, but how does unemployment for many people, there are, uh, what, over 3.4 million people who are unemployed in our country right now. And so um, how does that unemployment or even permanent loss of a job affect our anxiety or whatever else that may be going on? Well, again, I, I, I know that the clinicians will speak much more intelligently on this, probably. Um, you know, it's so unfortunate that in our country, uh, women and um, having certain things as being successful uh, and being valuable and having meaning. So the moment that any of those things are no longer there. Not only is it the natural loss of things that you actually need, but there's this whole other element of worth and value and failure uh, that gets attached. And we're talking about trauma. And so I think that uh, on top of the natural uh, situation of someone losing their job and the implications of that as far as paying bills and all of that, there is this other thing of I'm a failure. Um, and I, I'm, I've let my family down. I've let my kids down. And so we talk about higher rates of suicide uh, during the Great Depression. That was one of the highest uh, rates of suicide that our country ever faced because people, again, felt hopeless uh, economically. So I think that although a person may still be able to make it, you know, by maybe asking or, or downsizing or making adjustments, the shame <clears throat> in their mind right? Back to what you said about getting help. I'm not going to live in a shelter. I'm not going to go to a soup kitchen or I'm not going to go to a dispensary to get food or, uh, you know, I'm not going to bring myself to that. Um, I have a member of my church um, who literally I'm, I'm trying to talk him off of uh, the ledge of suicide because he feels like he as the breadwinner is a failure to his family because he can't provide for them, right? Because um, he's equate, so he's equated unemployment with failure. And I just think that that's a that's a that's the side of the pandemic trauma conversation we need to have because people are gonna I mean people have lost their jobs and there's some jobs by the nature of the pandemic that will never reopen uh and so when a person has only been trained in that one area right how did they retool themselves but i believe that in christ all things are possible and you can retool yourself and that's the joy of being a christian is that there is the whole idea that good friday wasn't it <laughs> you know, that there is a opportunity for God to do the impossible. And so I just encourage people who know people, I'm sure this is going to be shared uh, beyond this to other uh, people that would watch that are unemployed or facing unemployment, that you don't believe that's the end dog. You have no idea what God is going to do and how God will open up and how God will provide. Uh, but to say that it's all over because I've lost my job is a fatalistic really demonic tool to take us out of here in some ways, but it's, it's really serious right now in America. Thank you for saying that Reverend Carey. Uh, I talked about that last time about using this opportunity to be innovative, uh, to retool, to rebrand. It's in us. We just become kind of lazy about it. You know, we got used to our jobs. We got used to our skill set. Um, I know I did. Um, and so I've had to retool, I've had to rebrand, and that's hard because it's breaking habits. Just like COVID has broken a lot of habits for us. Uh, we have to create new habits. So Zoom is a new habit. I don't <laughs> like being on as many Zoom calls as I'm on on a daily basis. However, it's a new habit. I had to adapt so I could stay employed, so I can keep a roof over my head. 
So this may be a chance for you to take an opportunity to develop some skills. A lot of the companies that are out here now, especially on digital platforms, are offering free certifications, free classes, free courses that you can get um, some kind of upgrading your skill set from. Take advantage of it. You've got the time. The hard part is being motivated. Right? It's just the, I could stop binge watching Netflix or I could learn. I don't want to. And so you got to fight that. And that's a war within you, right? Because it, it kind of identifies the fact that I don't want to do anything new. But, you know, we have to do a new thing, right? Uh, even us being baptized and becoming Christians, that's, that's becoming a new person. you got to baptize yourself <laughs> and come out new. So go in the water, submerge yourself in the information, submerge yourself in all of the, the ways to build yourself up and come out a new person. Like, wake up and be somebody different. He has put it in you. He's made you innovative. Don't you dare sleep on this. Rise up. Get a support system. Get people around you who are going to push you, who don't care about how stubborn and how mean you could be sometimes and how resistant you could be and how scared you are. Because at the core of that is just fear. It's the fear. Have somebody who's not afraid to challenge you. Take advantage of this. You know, in America, stuff isn't free very often. So if it's free. Um, a couple of thoughts, and I, I think I shared last time that we're kind of navigating this as a family. Um, and one of the things that I've seen a lot all over Instagram in particular, people are like, you know, you need to be extra productive in this time. Like, here's all the things that you can do, so on and so forth. And I think yes, and I want us to all remember and kind of sit in, we are all experiencing a pandemic. <laughs> we are experiencing the trauma of a pandemic. And I think that in and of itself also means that it's a moment to do some self-work, right? I think productivity is one thing and it's important. And is this the time that you might want to engage in some virtual therapy, right? Like you are experiencing a trauma. How do you work through the trauma? I think is really important. The other things that I will offer is as we've navigated this, how do you take advantage of what kind of what Nicole was saying, what this moment is offering. So what I mean by that is, for instance, for us, we've refinanced on our home, right? There's some things that made sense to do some of the rates dropped. So that provided a little bit of relief. Um, a lot of us have educational loans, student loans. There's some relief happening there where you don't have to pay anything for the next 90 days. So how do you think, okay, I don't have to put money there. So is there a little bit more money in my pocket to make things stretch and ends meet? Um, credit card companies are deferring. Um, there's, there are free trainings available. So there's lots of different relief, even the stimulus check, right? Like all these different things. How can you look at what God has given you and say, okay, how do I exercise wisdom in figuring out how to make ends meet as I need to on a monthly basis? You know, and that's kind of what we're doing in our household right now, given that my husband lost his job pretty early in all of this, and we have two little kids and we have a home and all of those things. The last thing that I would offer is that one thing that I've been really grateful and really proud of him with is that although job prospects seem kind of glimpsed right now, he's kind of been picking up on like, how can I support our household. What does that look like? So you're on all these Zoom calls. How can I help with the kids? Or is there something I can put in the oven to help? Or let me try to think about things that need to happen around here, um, which has been a huge help and support overall to the entire household. So I think absolutely income and resources, financial resources coming in are one way to support the household. But I think there's multiple ways of doing that. And as roles and things shift, how do we, how are we also able to shift our expectations of ourselves? and one another to be able to meet the goals of the family. I think all that what you all were saying were great, which kind of led me to the next question that I was going to ask. You sort of answered it in your response to this question, but for those people who are hearing, this is that season. 
you know, from the pulpits and the podiums and, you know, seminars and workshops, and they see the things that are out there and they see that there are courses and they see that there's a new way and they're trying to think of a, a, a preneur that they can preneur about. They, you know, they can't figure that out because they lack concentration because of this pandemic. What do you say to them? Uh, that may be a medical issue. So it may have already been there before, uh, but trauma has a way of making new things um, at the same time. So uh, the lack of being able to focus and concentrate and please understand I am there. I consume way too much coffee now, um, but your brain is not meant to do this. You know, we are meant to feel the energy of the room. We are meant to pick up on subtle cues right now and which makes this whole dynamic weird i'm looking at the screen i see myself but i'm not looking in your eyes and so i'm missing that connection right so it's not even a natural way to connect with people and so the hard part about it that is we're not focusing because it's not natural to focus this way and so we're kind of fighting our, our wiring to to make this space as normal as possible so i would consult a physician if you have an opportunity to uh, talk to another professional even if it's a counselor or a pastoral care within the church someone who can direct you to resources that can help you to focus and rule the medical component out of it but mental health issues are medical issues so if that doesn't work, then you need to seek a mental health professional. So someone with the training can help you. Someone can put you in a safe space where you can um, have a conversation. And medicine may not always be the solution. Sometimes we have to change some of the habits, some of the environments we put ourselves in, but that's up to them to work with you individually on to help you to gain some of the focus and concentration back. Yeah, and I, let me just respond, Nicole, with something you said about, uh, <clears throat> And mental health is 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 health, you know, and this is a huge thing of our um, urban or African American brown people don't really lean into is that when my brain is not firing right, that's nothing to be ashamed of. You know what I mean? And we just don't talk about that. So for some reason, there's so many people. I listen. I see it as a pastor every single Sunday. Uh, I'm like, you can't, you can't pay attention. You just can't. So when I jump, when I move around, they're like, okay, 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 he's moving, you know? And so people think that a lot of my demonstrative movements have to do with my style. It's just that I'm preaching to people who have very low attention deficit, uh, you know, and there's no shame in that is what I'm saying. And I think finding out whether or not that's a reality, if it's really clinical or not, uh, sometimes you all, there may be some practices, like she said, of, of, uh, of the type of stimulation that people are getting that doesn't lend them to being able to focus. And there's some ways to train themselves to be able to do that. So I just think that we need to remove the barrier of shame away from the picture when it comes to attention um, and not feel as though I'm, I'm wrong because I'm wired the way I'm wired. I'm wired. God wired me this way. There's no shame in it. There's no shame in it. I don't feel bad when I go to, the, when I get glasses, I don't go to the optometrist saying, oh my gosh, I'm just so embarrassed that I, I don't have 20-20 vision. You just go to the optometrist and get glasses. So why is it that if my mind doesn't fire or think the way it should, that there's a shame associated with it? We've got to remove that stigma to move forward. Agreed. I just want to be conscious of the time. I know that we are now at 5.05 our time. And so I apologize to you speakers for us going a little bit over. I just want to ask one last question uh, and we'll just have to do it another time. Uh, and this is kind of a connection and I want to give a chance for some people. Hey, Yara, I want to give an, a chance for other people to, you know, put some questions in the chat box so that we can take that if we haven't answered your question. Um, there are, and there's one combination that question came in the chat box with a question we already were going to talk about is that there's a family experience difference in trauma levels in a household. 
uh, and it's not the same for everyone in that household. Uh, for instance, um, I'm an extrovert, my son's an introvert, we're killing one another. But one of the things that a, a person indicated in the chat box is how do we help even our children understand this pandemic and the changes to this world uh, with no summer camp, with no vacation, no graduations? How do we explain it to them as well as to others in our, our sphere? People have had to change their weddings. People have had to change uh, lots of things. How do we address those things? Uh, I have three school-age children at home. Um, they never had a break from COVID. They went on spring break and they came home and they were right back in school. Uh, they weren't physically in school, but their school had transitioned online as if they already knew COVID was coming seven months ago. Um, very strange. But um, they moved everything. And the hard part is my son finished eighth grade this year. And so they don't really do graduations out here too much. but to see the fact that he didn't have a, a party. Um, he wasn't able to kind of close it out the way he wanted it to. And uh, people's proms are canceled, graduations are canceled. People who finish doctorates and they want that hood. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big moment. And, uh, and the ceremonial aspects of things that we've become accustomed to, once again, don't provide the closure that we need. I've been very honest with my children. I don't overload them with COVID. I don't watch the news with them. You can know that their brains are going to absorb trauma differently. I have adulting experience where I can parse through the data and make some types of decisions, but they are literally living in the moment all the time. And so they don't really have the capacity to really parse it the same way. So my simple answer to them is, I don't know. I don't know. My one is just going to be over. I don't know. Uh, what can we do? Let's just do some more creative stuff. But they're so sick of the house. They're sick of being inside. They, they don't want to do anything. And I don't blame them because I don't want to do anything. So and to the level where you can identify with their experience and know what it has felt like. Uh, imagine not going to your prom. I mean, that was just the bee's knees. You're like, oh, I get to get my dress and my hair done and go to Macy's to get my makeup done and my shoes and take pictures. Like, it was the whole thing because everyone else had done it before. Imagine the loss of that and how do you build closure for that space? And trust me, years from now, they're going to have some feelings about it, but give them the safe space to express it. Um, and, and things are just not going to be back to normal. And I tell my kids all the time, there's no one alive that I know of who can say they've ever been through anything like this. I said, but let's count the blessings like Leslie was talking about, you know, our prayer requests and our journals. Let's talk about all the things we can do that people 100 years ago didn't have. We can do Zooms. We can do FaceTime. You know, we have ways to connect to us. I was like, imagine if you didn't have that. You didn't have PlayStation 4 and video game consoles. You just had to look at my face all the time. Um, and that would be horrible. So, um, and in terms of relationships, please trust and believe. I am happy to not have killed my husband and him have not killed me because I'm an introvert and he's an extrovert. So he needs a lot of attention and I don't. And so I'm glad that he goes to work a couple of times a week. That helps him out. That helps to get him out my hair. Uh, encourage people who are extroverts to go on mask jogs, walk around the block, uh, go attend a service in a parking lot, like drive through. I don't know if you all are doing that here, but that's a big thing here in Arizona. Uh, drive through services. They sit there, they talk, find a way to get that extroversion uh, met. And what it does is it helps your introvert in the house because they get to be alone. So send them away so you can be by yourself. Tell your kids you don't know. And it's not a fix, but it just helps to buy you a little bit of time. Before you guys continue, and that's very good. Before you guys continue, those of you who are online, there's a chat box. If you have a question, please put it in quickly into the box so that we'll make sure that we address it if it has not been addressed in this uh, way. That's really good, Nicole. Anybody else want to share on that? Yeah. So I just wanted to chime in too. You know, I think that we 
kind of get used to things and believe that it's a right to have certain things um, that, you know, that how things have been is just what I deserve to have ad infinitum. And I think God and his wonderful sense of humor sometimes reminds us that, you know, I'm all you really need. And so I don't want you to lean into any patterns, any uh, expectations that uh, that may not always be there. And I think the joy of this, I don't know if you guys had a chance to watch the, the graduation celebration with all of these artists that came together to do this big graduation video conference thing. But again, it's not going to ever be the same. But I think that there's some things that we can do creatively and some things that we can do uh, thinking differently with our kids um, that enable us to connect with them in ways that listen there are families good or bad that are connecting that have never connected now again if they've been dysfunctional and there's been some drama then that is also you know become very very obvious because now the pandemic has made it come to light but there are families that are eating together there are families that are eating together for the first time there are families that are preparing meals as opposed to drive through for the first time. And so I think that if we continue to let our kids know that, hey, you know what, this sucks. And we have no idea when it's going to I'm glad I get a chance to be with you guys. I get a chance that we get to sit down together. And then all of a sudden, they and, it's, and their little minds may not be like, but I hate this. I'd rather be whatever. But at least they get a chance to see another perspective of the pandemic. And, and how it's brought us together and how we've spent so much time together. Look at what we made. Our family's doing a painting together. Listen, I, I mean, we've never done a, I didn't even know that's something you could do. You know, but the little bitty thing that each of us take a number and it's this big oil painting that we're doing. But the bottom line is that on the other side of the pandemic, we have this oil painting that's gonna be beautiful that we've all done together. And we've never done anything like that. So I just think they can leverage uh, this and I think that our kids, especially the younger ones, uh, even though some things have been taken, they can see the the good in this. That God, God is still here. We're still here. Uh, some of those other things, it'll change. What if the whole world changes and we can't ever go back to that? We still got each other, and I, and we still got God. And I think those are the things that should be the anchors anyway, and not the creature comforts that could change on a dime. Yeah. That's great. Anyone else? I don't see any questions in the chat box. I wonder if that is true. If you all will all um, either unmute yourself or you can show yourself and, and raise your hand or let me know. Uh, if you had a question that has not been answered, I want to make sure that we have a chance to do that real quickly as we honor the time of these professionals who have to get back to their clients, get back to their church, um, do the things that they need to do. This is for you. And so we don't want to assume that there's something burning in you that needs to be addressed. So I'll give you just a second to let me know. Reveny Bad. Yes, Estella. This is Estella. Mm -hmm. I I, I'm dealing with it differently. I'm eating and I've gained, I know, over 25 pounds. Um, so that's how I'm dealing with it. And I, I wanted to know if maybe you could address it. Maybe I'm not asking the question right. Oh, no. For those that are sitting home eating, you know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Estella. Sure. You can all unmute. I'm going to mute again. Um, so one of the questions that we were going to ask is that there with people have noticed sleeping patterns that have changed and eating habits that have changed uh how do we deal with that in a self-care mode anybody want to jump in on that i'll just quickly say that um eating is a stress response right so our changes to our sleeping patterns, changes to our eating patterns. I apologize in advance, my children are home. Um, so you'll hear some background noise. All of those are stress responses. So one of the things that in psychology and mental health training, we learn about is mindfulness. Like how are we becoming aware of our actions and where's our emotional state when we're doing those actions? So an example of that is um, I used to 
kind of pick at my nails all the time. And I never realized I did it. And then I started to just pay attention. So anytime I would go to pick at them, I would think like, what am I feeling right now? And it was, I was feeling anxiety. Like I was worried about something and I would pick at them. So instead of picking at them when I felt anxious, like I still thought like, what am I feeling? I'm feeling anxiety or I'm feeling worried. Then I might write something instead. Or maybe I'll just walk down the hall or do something differently. So I think one, becoming aware, at least you're aware that you're eating more right now, but the why is the question, right? What is coming up for you when you go and grab whatever you're going to grab? And what might you do to distract yourself from that? If it's outside of the meal times or outside of the times that you would normally eat. Um, also, as the weather's getting nicer in Chicago, this is a great time to go outside and take a walk, right? If you need your mask, if you feel comfortable with your gloves on, whatever it is, go outside and take a walk. Say every day at noon or at one or whatever time works for you, I'm gonna get outside, get some fresh air. It's, it's something about getting the sun on your face, air on your face, and being able to take a moment to exhale outside that changes our mental state. Um, so making a commitment to doing that will also make a difference. And Estella, something tells me that, you know, you make your food too delicious. So just start making it nasty. You won't eat it. <laughs> or have somebody cook for you whose food is nasty. You won't eat it. You're like, oh, I have nothing in the house. So um, I, I made that suggestion to my girlfriend. I was like, you cook too good. That's your problem. I said, I eat your food. So, <laughs> so I just know it's a natural black woman thing. We just make good food. So I don't know. Under salt something. Don't season it at all. And <laughs> It won't be appealing, but I understand. I've been stress eating. I have gotten what I call my bears coating in the non-winter season, uh, but making different choices uh, like lead, it's, it's hard to be mindful because a lot of times we are mindlessly mm -hmm. eating and we're mindlessly doing things. And so we're not even paying attention. And just your awareness of it just kind of changes it. And so when you look at that delicious sweet potato pasta on the counter and you're like, all this for me? um you could just say i'm just gonna have a little bit for me and um and that may help but the fact that we're not moving and we're stuck at home that takes away the activity that used to kind of counter that so it makes it really hard to not gain weight because we're not getting rid of as many calories as we normally would so to keep up our same eating habits or increase it and we're not increasing the activity and we just get softer one other quick strategy, Estella, is also to like set your intention before you start eating. So for instance, Nicole mentioned the sweet potato pie. Say, I'm gonna have a slice of pie today. So I'm not saying you shouldn't have your pie. I think you should absolutely have your pie. Was to say, I'm gonna have a slice of pie today and then I'm gonna stop. So when, after you eat your pie, if you feel like you want to just go for a second, remember you said, today I'm only gonna have one slice of pie. So I'll eat another slice tomorrow. Um, and those very small things, like I do that a lot with, I don't deny myself much, but I'll just say, I'll have one cookie instead of five, right? I'll have 16 chips or whatever a portion of chips are instead of the whole bag. Like I'm pretty good about being disciplined and that's some of this, right? Some of what routine provides us with is some built-in discipline and without the routine, we have to create that discipline for ourselves. So how you create it for yourself will vary, but that's one way that you can do it. So you say like, I'm hungry, I'm about to eat breakfast, I make two eggs and some two slices of toast, and that's gonna be my breakfast. So if you finish that and you're like, well, maybe I could have, nope, set your sights on lunch and what you're gonna eat then. I wish I could be as <clears throat> spiritual and disciplined in my response as all of you all. <clears throat> um, but I, I can't. So one thing that that happened for me is I refused to buy any new clothes that were bigger. And so as I uh, as I have filled out my clothing and it becomes obvious to everyone else that I've filled out my clothing, I realize that the next step is me busting out of my clothing because I'm not going to buy new clothing. And for me, just for me, it helps me to say, OK, 
don't eat the whole don't eat the whole cake harvey i mean the whole cake really the whole cake i have sat down and eaten that whole cake this this COVID 19. i'm just letting y'all know i hey Full disclosure, whole cake, big old chocolate cake by myself. My wife and my daughter walk six miles every day. And I say, God bless you. God keep you as my prayer as I eat the whole cake. Uh, but because I have a, I, I refuse to buy new clothes, uh, I literally uh, then have to stop eating as much. So for me, that is one way I, I keep myself from continuing to expand uh, and say, look, you know what? You got to get back into what you need to. And that's just for me. I wish I could be as deep about mindfulness. And I mean, those are some good things. I just don't, I'm not going to spend no more money on my clothes because I've had two other sets of clothing that I've grown out of. And I refuse to be the fat preacher. I'm not going to be the fat preacher guy. I'm just not going to be him. So praise God. Amen. We got another question in the chat. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Estella. We got one last question in the chat. Um, I think we addressed this, but I'll just read it um, just real quickly. It says, uh, once we start mingling again with others, how do we decide who our children can get close to? Um, I think we had talked a little bit about that earlier. Uh, but we may decide that they can hug certain people like grandparents and not others. I assume this is when we get back to church or those kinds of things like that. What is the best way to explain to our children of all ages how to uh, maneuver that? Yeah, uh, Carol, I saw that question. So yeah, just to reiterate, I think that again, we said developmentally, children especially, uh, whether introvert or expert, I mean, they enjoy touching and hugging. That's just kind of part of their developmental process. So as we re-enter, I think finding out who has, uh, uh, you know, abided by those practices of social distancing and done all those right kinds of things, uh, whether it be a relative, especially a grandparent or auntie, someone that you can, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. If you have any concerns about that person, say, hey, I know this is going to seem strange, but can I do a temperature check? And can I, I mean, and it sounds like it's over the top when you're talking about the health of your own child, uh, you just might want to do that. But if you, if you have a grandparent or a loved one that is uh, part of that kid's uh, life, I would allow that um, to happen. But I think we have to guard against those larger gatherings, even at church or whatever, where kids or adults are just going back to, I don't, I don't see us going back to hugging, uh, for a while. I don't even know what that would look like in, in, in this new reality because we just don't have a cure uh, at all. So until there's a vaccination, right, and we're able to have something that we can take that keeps us safe from this, I just don't think that it's going to be uh, reasonable for that. But for grandparents, for aunts, uncles who have sheltered in place, they followed all of the uh, things, I think it would be great for the kids to be able to connect with them. I think it'll be actually very important for them to do that. But that's a great question, Carol. Yeah, one thing I wanted to just kind of bring up, it's kind of natural for like, because I got like young neighbors and they just automatically run up to you and hug you when they see yeah. you because they don't like, especially the little ones. It's yeah. just an instinct of theirs. And so that like you want to pull them back and then they don't understand what's happening. Like, well, how come I can hug grandma, but I can't hug this lady. So it's just, it's rather confusing. So I guess for the younger ones, it would be, how do you explain that and just maybe have a conversation with them? And it's almost like saying you have you ever have your tummy ever hurt before the whole world's tummy is hurting and and the thing about the tummy hurting is that when people hug for some people it makes their hurt their tummy hurts more you know i mean break it down so like we want to protect you from from anything happening to you and there are a lot of people right now in the world that just they're just not doing well they're not they're kind of sick and so i mean it's, it's hard to do and there's no playbook but i think being honest with them i think by not explaining it to them is more traumatic right so if they're like i'm built to hug and you're telling me i can hug granny but i can't hug i but saying you know what we're keeping everybody safe because just like we've been here with each other we're only hugging grandma uh, and grandpa right now we're not hugging anybody else and it may be hard for their brains to get it but uh yeah i think you just have to almost create like like kids being told not to go into the street 
or they don't fully understand why I can't go into the street. They don't fully understand why I can't go to the stove. They just know, don't go to the stove. And you've got to almost kind of put it down and not try to have their minds wrap around a pandemic when developmentally they may not be able to grasp the magnitude of that. And there are also some kid-friendly YouTube videos that explain the germ transmission and how germs are passed. Uh, I saw this great activity where you cover your kids' hands with chalk mm. all over, so all over it, and you just let them go throughout their day. Don't tell them why. Just let them do what they want to do and pick a pink, pink chalk, blue chalk, white chalk, whatever it is. And then you use that as a teaching moment to say, wow. now look, I can see every place you've been. Cause I tracked it. So you got the chalk mark here. You got it on the kitchen counter. You got it on the refrigerator handle, and that's what germs are. You know how these things are transmitted. So you can kind of minimize the um, or make it smaller for the teaching moment. But there are lots of videos out there. I've shown my kids a couple of them. But I think the chalk idea was really good, especially when you're working with younger kids who really don't understand the concept of germ theory. It can really, really identify all the places they've been. And I think that like having like no one likes to vomit. And so that's gross to all kids all the time. So it's a great reference to say, you know what, the stuff on your hands can make somebody else vomit. No, that's so nasty. And so now you give it this very childlike, innocent space to explain it. And then the crazy part is you'll watch them teach it to other kids. So, um, and that's when you know the message has gone forth. So now that you conquer the, the hugging thing, but you explain the idea about grandma, we don't want her to be sick. We want her to be around for a long time. And I don't know if you got germs. So um, it may help, not a guarantee, but it was, uh, it's an interesting exercise. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I want to honor the time that you all had. If everyone will open up their mics and if you all will give our speakers a round of applause for taking time out of their schedules to help us. Will you do that now? If everybody will unmute and just give them a Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let me just say thank you, Yvette, for uh, caring enough about us and about uh, the community of uh, people that are on this uh, Zoom and others that will watch to have this conversation. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your shepherdship. Uh, you are a shepherd. You are one of the most amazing shepherds I know. And so thank you. So thank you for shepherding us, really, with this conversation. So uh, we appreciate your leadership, and we thank you. Can we give Yvette a big hand, please? Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Yvette. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. Uh, Dr. Leslie, would you end us with a word of prayer if it's safe for you to do so? Yes, we might hear some screaming in the background, but we'll just say it's a joyful noise. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day and thank you for always providing a way for us to come together. Lord Jesus, as you see each and every person on this call and every extension of them, Father God, and their needs, Lord we just pray that you'll meet them at their area of need, Lord God. You'll help to calm spirits, Lord God, and center people, ground them in assurance that you have all things under control. Father God, we just thank you so much for this time together, for Reverend Carey, for Nicole, sharing from their personal journeys and giving great nuggets for all of us to be able to move forward with. Thank you for your presence with us. And as we move forward, Lord God, we just pray that you'll continue to give us the reassurance that you are with us every step of the way. We thank you for this time together. We cherish it. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.